The United States has been trying to achieve energy independence for over 40 years. In this presentation, we'll take a look at the history, the current facts, and some suggested solutions. Before we begin, though, we have to acknowledge that we're, we're living in interesting times, and that's really an understatement. The coronavirus crisis cut down oil demand by more than 30%. And recent trading anomalies even pushed oil prices to negative territory. Some of the U.S. major oil basins are almost completely shut down because there are no takers for the oil. So as a note, this presentation is really about 2019 data and the world will face when we reopen for business in 2021. Very little reflects the anomalies of today's world crisis. You've probably heard of the following statements repeatedly in the media, but are they correct? The U.S. is energy independent. It's absolutely not true. The U.S. is a net exporter of energy. Again, this is largely not true. And the U.S. is the world's largest producer of oil. Well, that really depends on how you define oil. Let's contrast these statements with the facts. In 2019, our net oil imports, that is, after we deduct any oil exports, were $192 billion. We can call ourselves a net exporter of energy if we measure that in units of energy, or BTUs, but in reality, we export coal and natural gas, and we import oil, which is like apples and oranges. After all, when you go to the supermarket and buy food, which is technically a form of energy, you look at the price first. And when it comes to energy costs, we are actually an energy importer. And are we the world's top producer? Well, that depends on the definition of oil. We are one of the top three, but not number one. And it really does not matter. Why? We'll explain that in the following presentation. Let's start with the term energy independence, which originated in the 1970s. Until 1973, oil, or gasoline, was very cheap. Following the OPEC embargo in 1973 and the Iranian Revolution in 1979, oil prices skyrocketed. There was actually a shortage of gasoline, and people waited for hours in line to fill up their tanks. The U.S. went into shock. The policymakers in 1979 and 80 then set a goal to become energy independent within 20 years. At that time, energy independence meant only one thing, oil. Let's see how we did. First, let's look at our main successes. The U.S.'s greatest success was eliminating the use of oil in electricity production. Today, we hardly use oil to make electricity, and it was largely replaced by coal and natural gas. The chemical sector now uses natural gas and cheap non-refinable oil as their main feedstock. We rarely use refinable oil anymore in the chemical industry. Improved car efficiency was another great initial success. Cheap available technologies, previously adopted by Japanese manufacturers, were used to improve efficiency by 30% within a few years. Another is that most of our heavy trucks used to run on gasoline. In less than 10 years, most of the fleet was converted to using more efficient diesel. The US is also not dependent on any single one country for its oil. We import from many destinations, thereby increasing the reliability of our supply. And last but not least, the US shale revolution increased our refinable oil production from 5 million barrels per day to 9.45 million barrels per day. Now let's look at some of our failures. The transportation sector is still dependent nearly entirely on oil with alternatives representing a very small percentage. And with all of our production, the US is still dependent on the global price of oil. We do not set the price nor control it. This will be discussed further in a little bit. And that leads to the fact that oil represents 31% of our trade deficit. A large portion of our defense budget is devoted to protecting that oil flow. 
according to the Rand Institute, it's around 30%. And that means our foreign policy is still very driven by our oil interests. As someone once said, if Kuwait grew broccoli, we wouldn't have gone to war to protect it. Let's dive in a bit more. When the term energy independence was created, it referred only to oil, because at the time we did not import any other form of energy. Today, however, the term energy is used in a sometimes confusing manner. Take the following examples. How many times have you heard the news anchor on TV saying, energy prices are rising? In reality, they usually mean oil. Price of natural gas and coal are not directly related to oil. Another example we already discussed, the U.S. is a net exporter of energy. Well, many people think it means we are a net exporter of oil, and that is not true. The term energy just adds more confusion. Most energy use in the U.S. is in two sectors, electricity and transportation. And there's hardly any connection between these markets. Electrical power is generated by a mix of coal, natural gas, nuclear, hydro, and a bit of renewables none of those sources are imported. The transportation sector is largely powered by oil products like gasoline and diesel, where a large portion are imported. So our energy independence problem is in fact not an energy problem, it is an oil for transportation problem. Now for a little bit of fun, We'll ask the question, how do you know if someone's a Republican or a Democrat? And you may be wondering, what's the connection between this and energy independence? Let's get into that. So if you ask them, what's the best way to replace oil as our driving fuel? If they say nuclear, then he or she is probably a Republican. And if they say solar or wind, he or she is probably a Democrat. Now, what's wrong with this answer? Can you run a car on a nuclear reactor? Can you run it on a wind turbine? Of course not. These are methods of producing electricity, not for running a car. Even if we converted all of our electricity grid to solar, wind, and nuclear, it would not reduce our dependence on oil by one bit. It's a largely unrelated market. This is the famous graph of US energy consumption produced by the EIA. U.S. Energy Information Administration for 2018. The 2019 graph is not ready yet, although 2019 data is available. As you can see, oil or petroleum represents only 36% of all consumption. However, when you look at the small print, you notice that this chart is a comparison by units of energy, not dollars. Take a minute to absorb the numbers. Oil, 36%. Natural gas, 31%. And coal, 13%. Now you've probably never seen this graph. It is also based on EIA tables, but no one shows you the money graph. We had to create it from EIA data. These are wholesale prices. For example, how much money refineries pay for oil utilities for natural gas, etc. This tells a very different story. It shows that we sent $507 billion on oil, which is 74% of wholesale expenditures. Coal is just 25 billion. And natural gas, which represents 31% of energy consumption, is only 14% of our cost at $98 billion. This table shows consumer prices, price you pay at the pump or the price you pay for your electricity bill, etc. Notice how oil share is down from 74% to 55%, although still the largest at $645 billion, while natural gas and coal are up. What is the main reason for this? It is the premium you pay for electric utilities. The oil market is a free market and is competitive. Therefore, the price you pay at the pump is not inflated. Utilities are regulated entities with hardly any competition. As you can see, they charge a heavy price of the American consumer.
let's learn a little bit more about oil. U.S. total oil production is the largest in the world at over 12 million barrels per day. However, we only produce 9.45 million barrels per day of refinable oil. Well, what's the rest? It's 2.78 million barrels per day of condensate. These are lower energy liquid molecules that could be used by various industries, but cannot be refined into gasoline and diesel. How can we produce so much of that? Well, traditional oil wells produce very small amounts of condensate. However, shale or fracking oil wells produce large amounts of condensates. These are of course sold at much cheaper price than refinable oil. Now, we didn't always call condensate oil. About 10 years ago, the EIA changed its reporting standard and decided to classify condensate as oil. The net result, of course, was a dramatic increase in stated U.S. oil production. However, that really did not have any effect on the transportation fuel market. The U.S. shale revolution is indeed exactly that. It should not be underestimated, as it changed the world oil market forever. In 2008, U.S. oil production was 5 million barrels per day and declining. The technology breakthrough of fracking allowed us to access large oil reserves that could not be economically retrieved using traditional oil drilling methods. The pace of technology innovation of the fracking revolution probably eclipsed the entire previous 50 years in the oil industry. It quickly dropped the cost of shale production to profitable levels, and we almost doubled our refinable oil production from 5 million barrels per day to 9.45 million barrels per day, bringing us theoretically closer to energy independence. Let's look further under the hood of this revolution. The shale revolution is not only about oil. Some even say that it was really a natural gas revolution. 10 years ago, the US was building LNG import terminals and we were running out of natural gas. A shale well produces large amounts of natural gas, which has allowed us to replace part of our coal-based electricity generation with natural gas. Today, we export natural gas and we still have too much. As a result, natural gas prices have plummeted to under $2 per MCF. Also, as we already discussed, we produce a lot of condensates, but we also produce many other carbohydrates. Our production exceeds world demand, so much so that today, oil producers pay money to get rid of their ethane. Otherwise, they can't sell the oil. So we learned about all kinds of oil and other molecules that come out of the ground. Let's pack it together into numbers. This slide summarizes the production totals of U.S. oil, ethanol, and other related liquids in 2019. Make sure to notice how many of these other liquids we end up producing. This slide summarizes U.S. imports of oil and related products. As you can see here, we import a lot of oil. This slide summarizes all U.S. exports. You might ask, why do we both import and export oil? First answer is that is how markets work. Another reason is our refineries. Many of them are built to process heavy oil. Most of the fracked oil is a very light oil that cannot be processed by some refineries. So it is then exported to places that can refine it. When you put it all together, the net result is that we imported 37% of our oil consumption just last year. Not all is rosy in the fracking sector. Despite technology improvements, the cost of production of a shale barrel of oil is higher than traditional land-based oil wells. When oil prices started sliding down, many shale operators became unprofitable. They kept on going with the help of external financing. But as the prospects of attractive returns to investors faded, the investors and lenders stopped refinancing the operations. Many shale companies had to fire employees and cut down on new investments and new drilling. 
Case in point is Whiting Petroleum. Its market value went down from 13 billion to just 60 million when it recently declared bankruptcy. There are many other such examples. One of the main problems in the shale sector is the reliance on oil as the main revenue source. The industry wasn't smart enough to develop markets for natural gas and other natural gas liquids, and as a result, those prices are extremely low and cannot do much to help improve their revenue. The U.S. shale industry is relatively young, about 10 years. It will take some time before investors are tempted to invest again. When oil prices recover, they will eventually and slowly come back but they could easily sink again. Question is how to make the shale industry less reliant on the price of oil. If it does not solve this problem, the industry will go bankrupt again when the price of oil declines. The key is to increase the revenue potential of each shale well by monetizing everything that it produces. The key is to find new markets for natural gas and natural gas liquids. There's only one market large enough for that, the transportation market. Simple math shows that replacing all of our imported oils with fuels made from natural gas will increase natural gas demand from 40,000 TCF to 56,000 TCF. Now, that would be a true revolution. We started this presentation with the concept of energy independence, and we've ended up here with the health of the shale industry. So what's the connection? Let's discuss the following situation. If the U.S. produced all of its oil, would we be energy independent? The surprising answer is no. Our position, of course, would be better, but we would not be independent from the price of oil. Today, world oil supply is greater than demand. As a result, prices are dropped and shale producers are going bankrupt. When Russia and Saudi Arabia recently decided to increase production, their goal was to bankrupt the U.S. shale industry. And when OPEC decides to cut production, they do that to raise the price of oil. Whenever the price rises too much, like in 2007, the world economy and the U.S. go into recession. So how exactly is this independence? Outside actors can either bankrupt our oil industry or drive us into recession. So much for independence. So this is how it all ties together. We cannot rely on oil alone for our transportation sector, or we will never be independent. We cannot rely on oil alone for the shale industry, or it will never be financially healthy. We need to create a competitive transportation market where oil, natural gas products, including CNG and ethanol, biofuels, and electric vehicles all play. This will create a more flexible market that could not be blackmailed by foreign actors. Higher revenues from natural gas-based products will keep the shale industry healthy for the long term. It will keep transportation costs down and prevent oil price-based recessions. That will make the U.S. truly energy independent. Now, it doesn't take much to do. If the government just removes some of our obstacles, the market would take care of itself. But that's not in the scope of this webinar and is a discussion for another time. In summary, as usual, this is a mix of bad and good news. We are not energy independent, but we can absolutely achieve that during this decade. Thanks for listening.